I know it's, it's unusual for some reason to get out of our seats and go pray with other people in church, but it ought not be. It's not here. So thank you for praying. That's just such an important part of what we do as a church. If you do not have a small group that yet, uh, it's still time. You can still join in one. The information for those is on the display board as you leave the building on the left side. A couple of things as we begin. The Christian church from the very beginning has been a place of teaching and learning from the very beginning. And uh, one of the things that we do is we uh, make use of that as best we can. And we have two things that we're using. One is a departure journal. We've been talking about that. We'll use that again today throughout the series through November. And the other is a John notebook where we can collect our notes about the gospel of John, what it is he's what is he saying? And then I have one more thing for you as well. We passed these out uh, last two weeks, but um, I wanted to make sure that these went into your hands. These are family devotions, but in order to do them, it requires taking some notes in the sermon. So I'm bombarding you with things today, but I, I enjoy doing that. It's one of the things I enjoy in life. And at this time, I want to ask the ushers if they would come forward. I have uh, maybe enough for at least all the families to have one. Moms or dads, you can have an older kid take the notes, or you can do them. And then you can follow up with these things to discuss them with the family later. Thank you, guys. Um, just make sure you get one. If you don't get one, just um, wave. You can just wave your hand around, and these guys will bring you one. But as they're coming, if you would go ahead and take your John notebooks out, you will need those today. And open your Bibles, of course, to John chapter 14. And we are learning about Jesus' departure. Everything we're reading in John 13, 14, 15, 16 occurs in the upper room. And Jesus is now downloading information, teaching lessons to his disciples because he's about to leave. His work on earth is, is almost done. He has some precious hours with his closest friends. And he has things to tell them that he wants them to learn so that they'll be able to hold on to their faith and endure what's coming. That's why it is his departure. So we're going to begin this morning with our, with our departure journal. So if you have yours, you can take that out. On the very first page of our departure journal, we wrote these words. I'm leaving, but I want you to know. This is a little journal that we'll be able to give to our loved ones, or maybe if we need to go on a long trip, we can hand it to them. If we're saying goodbye to the kids at college, we can maybe hand them this full of the best things you know, your, your greatest advice, little nuggets. I'm leaving, but I want you to know. And we've already written a few things. Feel free to write whatever is on your heart, but today I want to kind of direct you to write something here based on our passage. I've entitled this entry, Greater Works. I'm leaving, but I want you to know. Would you guys say that with me? I'm leaving, but I want you to know. John 14, 1 to 14 is what's behind this. All of these have been kind of intense and personal, haven't they, everybody? Which you would expect because Jesus is leaving. There's a lot on his heart and mind right now. Today I'm writing this. I'm leaving, but I want you to know your belief in Christ is the most important thing you have. So hold on to it. There will be storms. There will be dark, dark days. There will be lies lies on top of lies, but hold on to your belief in Christ. You must hold on to it. But how are you going to do that? Father God, we are well aware now 
of how difficult life is. We also know scripture which interprets that for us. That already tells us that. That the world is incredibly broken. All kinds of darkness and evil exist here. But even in the midst of it, you call out to people to trust in Christ. And that if they will take hold of that rope and hold on to it and never let go, they will find themselves dragged, arriving into the heavenly country. And will be able to look back on all these things and know that it was worth it. And understand where the brokenness and the darkness fit in. But in the midst of it, Father, we admit to you, it is difficult. When the storms come, when the dark, dark days come, it is challenging for us. And today we, we see the disciples who are all sitting around trying to figure out what you were talking about. That soon you would be gone and they would be alone and they would have doubts and they would have a lot of emotional doubt. And in that time they would need to hold on to their faith in you. And if they would, they would see it completely vindicated. So help us to learn those lessons today in our passage and help us to help one another hold on to our faith in Christ. We're thankful that we cannot let it go. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. We'll come back to that departure journal later. But let's turn now to uh, John chapter 14. And let's spend some time in this passage and see what it has to say to us. You've heard these words before, John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. I think we could probably stop there for a while, don't you think? How many of you have had the experience where your heart was troubled? Now, this word trouble has been used several times already in the gospel of John to talk about the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus was troubled. He tells us, my, I'm troubled in my spirit because of all the things that he's facing. So listen to how great this is. Jesus knows what's coming in his own life in the next hours even, the betrayal, the separation from the Father, the torture, the death. He knows what's coming when he pays the sin debt of the world. He knows that's coming. Do you think his heart is a little troubled? And he's looking at his disciples saying... Look, if my heart's troubled, I think I can assume that there's coming a time where your heart's going to be troubled. And he gives them, this is actually, this verb is in the form of a command. Do not, you must not let your heart be troubled, agitated, disturbed. Let not your heart be troubled. And this is what he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now that's a strong statement, isn't it, everyone? And this is really, really important for us before we even go. I know we're just in verse 1. But he says, you know, you know how you, hey, by the way, if you circle words or jot them down or highlight in your John notebooks, one of the words you always want to watch out for is the word believe. Because it's so crucial to us and our lives. So where it appears is worth giving a second glance. And if you'll circle it or highlight it, that'll cause you to give it a second glance. So here you have it twice. You believe in God, and all of us said, yeah, believe also in me. And this isn't the first time in the Gospel of John where Jesus will call people to believe in him the same way they believe in the Yah, Father God. And of course, that gets him into some big trouble, but he's trying to press this into people for reasons that we'll come into later. But he says, believe in God, believe also in me. And I think it might help some of us at least, it helps me to think of it in terms of this. How many of you believe in a creator? And, and you probably think there are logical reasons to believe in a creator. Because everything exists, right? So you think, I believe in a creator because that makes perfect sense to me. I don't go around doubting them very often. Jesus says, believe in me that way. 
believe in me that way. He said, well, okay, I believe Jesus was a real person, but how do I believe in Jesus as the son of God who rose from the grave? Well, we, we're going to spend this Easter as we finish the gospel of John on why we have such strong reasons for the historical evidence of the resurrection of Christ. And when you see those, and when you understand that explaining it another way doesn't make sense, then it helps us as believers go, you know what, I believe in Jesus as he makes logical sense, the same way I believe a creator makes logical sense. And Jesus is saying, the same way you believe in a creator, I want you to believe in me. But you might also translate it this way, trust. So be personal for a second. Trust me. Something's coming. And all the disciples sitting in the room are going, yeah, we can tell something's coming. Trust me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told, like I would have told you. If there wasn't enough room in heaven for you, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This isn't the first time that he said that either. That if those who serve him, those who will follow him, those who will take hold of that rope, those who will take hold of Christ, will be with Christ. Safety, security, it will be okay. It won't seem like it's okay, but it will be okay because you'll be where I am. Like that's the simple form of it. You have all these questions. We have tried to explain the theology of heaven and what happens. But the, but the big issue, the big idea is this. Just love me, trust me, and you'll be with me. How is that? And you and I say, well, if you're with us in the boat, then a storm isn't quite so bad. Right? Trust me. So let's go back just a little bit, though. He uses the, my translation uses the word mansions. What other rooms do you, uh, what other verse, words do you have there in verse 2? In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And that's good because the word is actually attached. It's this, has the same etymology of the word that means to dwell or to abide, which is coming in John 15, right? You remain. How many of you remember hearing that word in our study of John, right? You'll remain with, to abide with him. So you get to stay in these abodes. But when was the last time you said the word abode? Excuse me, I have reservations for an abode. So, but, but that's a good word to use for it. Any other translations? Many rooms. That's also good. Probably, let's, you could translate Martin Luther translated as apartments, but apartments may not make you very happy. Here's another one, suites. How about a suite? Everybody said that sounds pretty, thank you. I know you're a church that likes those kind of jokes. It's a suite. So if you could picture a suite, but the idea isn't necessarily a literal house with a bunch of suites right now. The idea is this, Jesus is describing heaven. Jesus is describing the place where God is as his house. And no matter whether there is a Downton Abbey estate there or not, when you go into the place, you're going to look around and go, God's house. Right? When you arrive eventually to on the heavenly country, the new earth, even though you're not necessarily looking at buildings, you're looking at beautiful, untouched earth, and you go... God's house. So in other words, this is a metaphor for heaven itself, and there's going to be a place for you there. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place. I'll come back and get you. You gotta trust me on this. And then he says in verse four, and I think this is very provocative, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. But the tense of it is perfective tense. So what he's saying basically is like the message pair. He's saying like this, and you already know how to get there. That sounds a little provocative, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, you already know how to get there, right? Like a teacher might do that. And you know what it takes to make an A, don't you? And what you can't wait for is somebody to say, well, maybe I don't know. Let's just say I don't know, right? And so it sounds like it could be provocative, but maybe not. Maybe not. Watch what happens. Thomas, oh, we all love Thomas, right? There's a little Thomas in all of us. 
He's the most skeptical, right, of them all. The, Thomas the doubter, doubting Thomas, my namesake, said to him, Lord, look, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? It sounds a little smart, Alec, at first, right? I don't think we have to read that into it, but it sounds like a little bit to us. First of all, we don't know where you're going. Second of all, if we don't know where you're going, we don't know how to get there, right? Now, what you're going to notice here is Thomas is going to speak up, and then later Philip is going to speak up. What has changed? Before all you had was Peter speaking up. Something has changed in the environment in the room that now people are dialoguing with the rabbi. What has changed? Judas is gone, right? Now the environment totally changed. So now you have people interacting, there's discussion. So, so Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. And then Jesus says this very famous verse, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way. Now the truth and the life, that's very important. But here the emphasis goes on way. Because he's just finished talking about the way. So you, if you were writing this, you'd probably underline the word way, or you'd put it in italics. And Jesus says, I am the way, Thomas. The truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. So let's break that down for just a little bit before we go any further. How many of you already have that verse committed to memory? Most of you have committed it to memory probably for apologetic use, right? Because most people say that if there is a heaven, there's, you can get there by pretty much being sincere about whatever your faith is. All roads lead to heaven, right? How many of you have heard that before? And you have John 14, 6 in your pocket ready just to throw it at them, right? Like a knife, right? So most of us have that in our apologetic somewhere, and that's true. But let's look, look, look at the verse just a little bit further in its context. Jesus says, I am the way. Now let's talk about the word mediator. Mediator is a person who does what? And that's circular reasoning. So that means somebody, somebody give me another word for mediator. A go-between. Why is it important to have a go-between? Especially in the case of God Almighty. You can't go to him. And last week we talked about the hiddenness of God. And one of the reasons God seems distant from us is because if we were to enter into his presence at this moment, what would happen to us? We would be incinerated because holiness cannot exist in the same place as sinfulness. So if we're going to come to God, he's got to come to us, which is exactly what Jesus is. The word became flesh and dwelt among us in John chapter 1 verse 14. And who, who sent the mediator? Well, some good, was it some like well-meaning human being that figured this out? This was the plan of the Father. He's being overly gracious to us, more than we deserve. He sends a mediator, and the mediator is going to show us the way to get to God. Aren't you glad that Jesus is the way? He's the mediator to get us from where we are to God. So Thomas, this is the answer to your question. We don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get there. And Jesus says, you do know how to get there because I'm the way to get there. And you know me, so you know the way. That's why Jesus said, you know the way. You already know it. They just didn't know that they knew it. You know the way, Thomas, because you know me. And if you know me, you know the way. I bring people, I carry people from where they are to Father God without being incinerated. That's my job. Everybody say, mediator. But he's not just the mediator of the way. He's also the mediator of the truth. What does that mean? That means if you want to know what God is like, Jesus is going to show you. We've always wondered what is it like? What is he like? Because no one can look at his face, right, without being killed. So what does he look like? Just we want to see him, right? But Jesus is the truth. So he tells us what God as truth, what he means. is not just truth in general. Right? We're not just talking about truth statements and propositional claims. What we mean is he is the mediator of the truth about God himself. What is God like? Everybody say, Jesus. 
And the Bible tells us, the New Testament tells us that Jesus is the fullest expression. Hebrews chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, Jesus is the full expression of what God is. If you ever want to know what God is and what he's like, everybody picture Jesus. What did he show us while he was on the earth? So he's the mediator of the truth. But that's not all. There's one more. What's the other one? He's also the mediator of life. And that is our biggest problem is death. Jesus is the one who can bring us from a place of death to a place of life. And we would think of John 3, 16, right? What kind of life, everyone? Everlasting life. Jesus is the mediator of that. He is the way to God. He is the truth about God. And he is the eternal life that God gives. So when Jesus said to the group, you already know the way of where I'm going, they knew the way because they knew Jesus, right? That's what Jesus is saying. So it's not meant to be provocative. What Jesus is saying is you actually already know. Maybe you don't know why you know, but you already know the way to get to the Father because you know me. Right, everyone? Okay. Let's go just a little bit further. Verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And that would have, if you were a good Jewish person, that would have made your antennas go up. Your ears would have perked up. Seen him. What do you mean, seen him? Because we don't know anybody that's actually seen him. Maybe, maybe some, they've seen some fire or they've seen a cloud or they've heard thunder and seen lightning, but, but actually seen him. Jesus is, Jesus is saying some really big stuff here. If you'd known me, you would have known my father. And, and this isn't the first time he said this. Remember, he said this several times throughout John, from John 1 through this point. He said several times, if you'd known me, then you know the Father. But if you don't know me, you don't know the Father who sent me either. And he's going to equate himself, his, talk about his unity with the Father several times in this passage. But let's pause because that's a lot. And let's summarize what we just read this way. Believing in Jesus is the way to the Father. Would you guys say that with me? Believing in Jesus is the way to the Father. Now, this one's good, I think, for me, because what you're going to see is a great question that's coming up in our text. And it's the question that every human being asks is, you know what? I believe there's a creator. I believe it. But honestly, I, how do you get to him? How do you actually know? How can you get to him? And Jesus is explaining, and he's saying something that very few people have said. Here's how you get to him, by believing in me. And he's going to flesh this out a bit further. But if you've ever had that question inside of your heart, this is how Jesus is answering it. Would you read it with me one more time? Believing in Jesus is the... So somebody says to you, you know, I believe in a creator, but how in the world can I ever get to it? How can I get at him? And then you would explain, well, the Bible explains this, and Jesus explains this, and this is the best thing you have, is that by coming to Jesus, you come to the Father. And all the people who have already done that in their lives, would you say, amen? amen. I have come to Jesus, and in that way, he has brought me to the Father. And now in the face of Jesus, I see everything of what the creator is like. Believing in Jesus is the way to the Father. But he goes further. Now that you're ready, things are going to get even deeper. Because now Philip is going to speak up. Aren't you glad these guys are speaking up, asking these questions? Because now we're in verse 8. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. It is, what's another translation? It is enough or will be satisfied, right? And Philip is asking the question that every human being has ever asked is, yes, I believe there's a creator. Show him to us. Just show him to us. Because if you just show him to us, that'll be enough and we'll be fine, right? Why wouldn't God just show himself to us? This goes back to the hiddenness of God that we talked about a couple weeks ago. So great question, but then Jesus uses that to teach a little bit deeper. And Jesus said to him, Philip, Philip, man, we've known each other for three years. I mean, you were standing right there. 
when I walked on water. You were standing right there listening to my words and you knew my words weren't, weren't like anybody else's words. And that's hard to describe. It's hard to be evidence of that. But you were standing right there when that guy who was born blind and everybody knew he was blind, his mom and dad knew he was blind, and even the, even the Pharisees investigated and discovered that he was born blind and I healed his eyesight without a doubt. You saw that for yourself. You were right there, Philip. And Philip's gears are turning. Just show us the Father. Just show us the Father. Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? And that's usually how you answer the hiddenness of God objection. If God the Creator exists, why doesn't He just show Himself to everyone? And you say, great question. Let's go to John chapter 1, where the Word was made flesh and God came into our world to show us once and for all what he was like. And then his spirit made certain that a record was made so that generations could have it. If you have known me, Philip, you know the Father. Now that's a strong statement to make, but even stronger statements come in the rest of the New Testament, which you know, Colossians 1.15. Uh, Hebrews chapter, I mean, John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus actually says, I and the Father are one. So this isn't the first. There's many, many of these claims, not only in John's gospel, but in others in the rest of the New Testament as well. So verse 10, do you not, oh, there's that word, everyone. Do you not believe, you want to circle, highlight, underline, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Someone gave this a fancy name called the formula of reciprocal imminency. Fine, right? Some of you are like, yeah, that's what I would call it too. <laughs> I actually started jotting that down in my John notebook. And that's fine, you remember that. I don't know this, just doesn't roll off the tongue that much. But the idea is Jesus is describing his oneness with the Father. Now, to do that for us requires some work, doesn't it, everyone? Because now we're talking about a being who is not like any other being. Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, he is a singularity. There's nothing else like him. So I can't say to you, here's a good illustration of the Trinity. There is no illustration because there's only one person like him, right? So that makes it difficult for our minds to get around. So Jesus doesn't use high theological words like the formula for reciprocal imminency. Aren't you glad? He's speaking to a group of blue-collar fishermen. They would have looked at him and said, hey, that's great. Somebody pass that bread. I'm kind of hungry. Right? He's looking at a group of people just like you and I, and he doesn't use high theological words. He simply says, the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Now, you try to work that one out as best you can, but it's going to fall short, but still, that's fine. Struggle over it. But what Jesus is describing is, let's use this word, oneness. So if you, if you want to write that down, oneness, then you can just use that word, and you won't have to use the longer words that we just used if you don't want. I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. The word, so let's pause there for a second. Everybody help me out. We stopped in verse 7 where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then Jesus made that exclusive claim that no one evidently knows when they start spouting off what we Christians really believe. That Jesus is actually not one way to the Father. He is the only way because to get someone from their sinfulness and darkness from where they are to Father God requires a kind of special person. Right? That's the theology of the Bible. Not just anybody can do that. Not just anything can do that. It's going to require a special person. Why is Jesus special in this way? Why is it that he can mediate us from where we are and be the way to get us to the Father? Why is it that he can do that and no one else can? 
That's right. Say it out loud. A little louder. Because the Father is in him, and he is in the Father. There isn't anyone else like that. That's why Jesus is the only way. Because when you come to him, you are coming to, and that can be said of no one else. Christianity is very unique in this regard. That's why Jesus is the one way. So let's move further. And then he goes on to give some evidence, right? Or to, to give some, let's use this word, to give some support. And he says, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Now he's talked about this before in John's gospel. He's trying to press it into their minds. And because people listened to Jesus, and I guess you just had to be there, because Jesus said some really great things. But when they heard the way he said it, they said, this guy isn't like everybody else. He speaks like somebody who, um, yeah, let me paraphrase. He speaks like somebody who actually knows what he's talking about. Is that okay? Paraphrase? And so when they heard that, they're like, this guy, this guy has words that I don't know how to explain it, but I just, I hang, I'm hanging on his words. And some people were hacked off at him for his words, but then there were these people that were just listening to him going, man, we just, we, why are you listening to him? Because nobody talks like he does. He talks like somebody who's been there. Like he actually knows God, and he's confident about knowing the way to God. And so there's something about his words. Everybody say words. But it's not just the words. Because for Jesus, now this is going to take some work and we don't have time, but for Jesus, the words and the works are connected. So you can jot that down and then work on it later. Because for Jesus, the reason why his words are authoritative, the reason why you couldn't stop listening to him was because the Father was in him and he was in the Father. That's his argument that he's making. And these are guys who did hear his words. These are eyewitnesses. They were there. And they're like, oh, yeah. But Jesus doesn't just say words. He links it also to works. Now, works is going to be a key word in the rest of our passage. Okay, so if you see works, now you've got to figure out what to do. You can pick something different for the word works than used for belief. So you might have to underline or circle or put a star or use a different color. So he says, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Do you see that transition? He just pivoted from words to works in verse 10. What Jesus is saying is there is a connection between what I say and then the works. And maybe one of those connections is the fact that he mostly uses words to accomplish the works. But listen to his argument. He says in verse 11, believe me. Trust me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you don't have enough belief for that, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. You were there. And we know the works that Jesus presented in John's gospel, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke record some other works as well, which John knew existed. So he was able to focus on different ones. But everyone was the very first work. It was a fun one. He, you saw me like wedding something. Did he multiply a wedding cake? He turned water. This is hard for Baptists to say. He turned water into as his very first. So I said, well, it wasn't real wine. It was just grape juice. Da, 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 da. People said it was the best wine. His very first miracle, he turns water into wine, right? But then John goes on to tell us about other miracles, a couple of healing miracles. There was the feeding of the, that was a miracle. Everybody there got to see it, to not only see it, they got to eat it, right? Just like at the wedding, not only see it, but drink it, right? These are people that are involved in the miracles. He does them as signs. He walks on the water, right? That's kind of a big sign, Right? Not many people walk on water. He does that as a sign. People are saying, well, if Jesus is real, he should prove himself. He's like, 
right? And then, and then, so he has these miracles. Now, all the miracles, as you know, culminate into the biggest miracle yet in Jesus' ministry, which was what? Raising, the, before, at, to this point today in John 14, raising Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus wasn't just in a coma. How did we describe Lazarus? He was dead, dead. Surely he, they, everyone expected his body to have been composed. For some reason, that's funny. It's a sick, sick church. <laughs> he had been dead for four days. And that was really, he intended that to be the high watermark of the signs that he was going to give to his people. I'm not obligated to give you these, honestly. But I'm going to give you these. And one of them is going to be my buddy Lazarus. I love that guy. And I hate the fact that death exists. It makes Jesus groan, right, in spirit. He's troubled in spirit. That was one of the other uses of that word. And then Jesus gives us a hint that he's actually more powerful than death itself. He says, I am the resurrection and the life, right? So he's done all these miraculous signs. And somebody say, well, big deal. Lots of people can do those miraculous signs. Everybody, when Moses appeared to Pharaoh... And he had his staff. And remember, Father God said, when you go to Pharaoh, Moses said, Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. And then God said, take your staff. And you're going to do some stuff with it. And that'll help people believe. And he takes his staff and holds it out. And his staff turns into a snake. For, most, for some of us, you're like, I'm, that did it. I'm good. I believe. Right? Because you were standing there close. And usually sticks don't turn into snakes. Right? Much less turn back into a stick much less be picked up and carried around. And you're like, that's a cool stick, right? But when Moses did that, what did Pharaoh's magicians do? The exact same thing. So for it to be a genuine miracle, does it mean that it cannot be copied in any way? It doesn't mean that. Still miracles are happening and they happened in the very presence of these eyewitnesses eyewitness, who watched them. And Jesus is saying, when you saw that happening, how many of you think I did that under my own ability? Jesus said, that's the work of the Father in me. People who are filled with themselves or evil, right? God's no, God doesn't work through them like this. So you've seen the work, so... So maybe that doesn't clear it up completely, but that supports what I'm trying to tell you. And that is, you've seen the miracles, you've heard the words, God's in me, and I am in God. That's why I am the way to God, and I am the way that you know God. So let's pause here for a second. Believing in Jesus is the way to the Father. Let's go to summarize the next set of passages, because the Father and the Son are one. That's the whole, this, this, is, this is the central component of Christian theology, of biblical theology. So would you read this with me? Believing in Jesus is the way to the Father because the Father and the Son are one. One more time. Believing in Jesus is the way to the Father because the Father and the Son are one. That's a, just a summary of what it is that John's trying to say. Why is Jesus special? Because he was not just an ordinary man. And his works... His miracles and his words support that. So let me pause here and make a couple of observations. Number one, Jesus is saying in this text that he is one with the Father. Would you guys say one? And you say, well, okay, I'm working through this. So in what sense is he one? Well, he's, in, he's one with the Father in at least a couple senses, all right? Here, here are a couple. First of all, he's one with the Father in the way that you know. Yeah, in the way that I know? Yeah. Because if I know Jesus, then I also know the... He's one with the Father when it comes to belief. Because if I believe on Jesus, that means I also believe in the Father. And what he's saying is, is kind of a package, kind of a package deal you're dealing with. Jesus also claims that there's a oneness with his Father when it comes to the words. Here, listening to him speak was like listening to the authority of the Father, and then the miracles. Watching a miracle that's done with all this power, you would 
most of you sitting there, like all the people that were in these situations, most all, not all of them, but most of them said, man, that's God at work right there. And Jesus said, in these ways, we are one, at least in these ways. There's more ways, but in these ways, there is a oneness between the Father and the Son. And there's, this is what he gives for support of it. To support that, he says, consider the words, consider the works. Look, I can't make you guys believe. Jesus is saying, I can't make... Philip, Thomas, I can't make you believe. But what I'm telling you is you've got good evidence. You've got good reason to believe. Consider the words. Consider the works. All right? And I want to, I want to go a little bit further. And I want to give you one more. Feel free to, to think through it. Jesus says, he goes right into verse 12. And this one I think is one of the more difficult ones that... Uh, we're going to spend a few minutes on. Jesus says, most assuredly, but you all know by now, what is the literal translation there? Help me out. Sing it. Isn't that a song? Verily, verily. No, just making that up. Uh, verily, verily, which we love saying that, right? People doubt us all the time, so we stop them in their tracks by saying, Verily, verily, I did return that book to the library. And it's over. It's over at that point because you've dropped the verily, verily on. But literally, what is he saying? Does anybody remember? The Greek word. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's a, you're exactly right. You're all thinking it. Some of you just shouted it out. Amen. Amen. Which is. That's a strong way to say it. Try that one when she asks about your library book. That'll definitely end it at that point. Amen, amen. So now once you've said that, now you're listening. Because he didn't say that about everything, but he's saying it here. Most assuredly, I tell you the truth. Amen, amen. Verily, verily, I say to you, he who believes, there we go, he who believes in me, listen for the key word, the works which we've already described what Jesus' works are, the works that I do, he will do also. Everybody say, whoa. Now Jesus is, this is strong. The works that I do, he will do also. And, oh, Jesus is going to take us up a notch. What does he say, everyone? That's hard. That's hard to say. How many of you underlined greater works? That's going to occupy our time here as we finish. And greater works, greater works than these he will do. Oh, and it all hinges on that last little phrase. Why? Because I go to my Father. Now, they don't know what he means by go. Jesus keeps talking about going. But when he's talking about going, they don't understand this. Where's Jesus going? In the, in the immediate context, where is he going? to the cross. If I go, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to my Father. If I go to my Father, by going, Jesus means if I take the Calvary road, when I take the road to the cross, I will accomplish for you what needs to be done in order to make possible the greater works. Oh, this is a lot here. Hang on with me. The greater works will be made possible in a time, which we're only hours away from it, when Jesus pays the sin debt of the world and at the same time on the cross dethrones Satan himself. And death will stop. The reign of death will be broken. Don't get me wrong. People will continue to die in this world. But for believers you're going to end up having to say other words because it's not quite right to say die. You have to say things like fallen asleep. You have to say things like departed. They've gone away. You'll have to use other words because for those people, Jesus promises before their brain stops waving, they will find themselves in the presence of their creator. And there's, of course, more to come. But all that is made possible by Jesus' work on the cross. So the bigger works that are coming include quite a real quite a big thing. Jesus is going to accomplish this on the cross, dethrone Satan. He's going to die for the sins of the world, and he's, he's going to seal the deal. He's going to make possible. He's going to finish 
this mission, and Satan, Satan is pushing Jesus and pushing Jesus and think that he's, he hasn't quite figured this one out yet. He's going to push Jesus, and he thinks that he's winning until Jesus dies, and he thinks it's over, but it actually was the real plan, which wasn't, you know, it was a bloody, awful plan, but it was the real plan. Now, it's almost like, a, you know that kid that pushed you in the swimming pool? Remember that awful kid? To this day, you want to find him and just beat him in the face, you know? Because you could barely swim, and they pushed you in the pool. And Satan goes up to push Jesus into the pool, and he's like, you know, we all just want to kick him in the face. But he pushes Jesus into the pool, and just as he, Jesus falls, he grabs Satan, and they both go into the pool, and they go deep. But only one of them knows how to swim. That's the idea. He kills the power of Satan by going to the cross, which no one was expecting. We get the idea in Scripture, it was kind of a secret that this was going to be the way it worked out. So even dark forces didn't know completely what was going on. He takes them by surprise. He accomplishes the mission. And then according to Scripture, he, he rises from the dead. He visits with his people his people, the ones who are going to be the foundation of the church to be evidence for them. And then he's going to leave. And in heaven, he is now on his throne. He's, he's, he has a real kingdom that exists in the hearts of all of his people all around the world. And those people are telling other people about Jesus for thousands of years to come. And he is patiently waiting with the Father. While he is there, he is a eternal reminder to the Father of the debt paid against that person's sin. So in that way, he is a high priest forever. Now, he has made all of that possible, including a kingdom. And so his kingdom of people, we learn about, begins rather largely. All these apostles get killed, right? With possible exception of John. They all get persecuted. They all get killed. And so that's the end of it all, right, everyone? Not at all. Their blood becomes the seed of the church, as Tertullian said. Any martyr that dies, the church just grows in that place. And the church now is growing. And from that church comes the teachings of Christ. And people now, yes, miracles are continuing. So yes, the works of Christ, the greater works include miracles. Yes, the greater works of Christ include his acts of love and the way God touches the world through his people now, which is happening, everybody say, more and more which is happening more and more now as God's people continue to grow and expand in every country on the planet. Scriptures are copied down and they're passed to all kinds of people. Everybody say greater works. There are, there are Bible colleges and seminaries to train people. Everybody say greater works. We've even got videos and movies and an entire music industry, right, that's committed to telling people about Christ in some way, shape, or form. I saw a, a video of a guy who had, man, it was on his heart to figure out how to have an evangelism ministry using rope. It was kind of like this little magic trick, and he did it in the subways in New York where people would stand on the platform for like, what is it, four minutes waiting for the next train. And he had perfected his gospel presentation using these ropes, the shape of a cross, these other things, that he could do it in exactly that amount of time so he could share the gospel and did it all day long and is doing it right now. And how many of you think that as he tried to figure out how to do that ministry, how many of you think he was probably praying about it? He's bathing the whole thing in prayer. Everybody say greater works. Man, we got, we got puppet ministry for kids. At the end of this month, we're going to give out hot dogs to people just to say to them, there is a gospel. And if a hot dog will help you hear the gospel, here's a hot dog. So that one day in the future, they're going to arrive at the throne of God and say, well, it's not fair that I'm here. It's not fair that I have to be punished for my sins in hell. And Father God's going to be able to stand there and say, are you joking? They rented a bounce house to try to get the gospel message through your thick head. You could have gotten it from the internet. You could have gotten it from music. You could have gotten it from the radio programs. You could have gotten it for tons of believers who died to give you the gospel message. Everybody say, greater works. And Jesus says, the greater works are coming. If I accomplish what it is I set out to accomplish on the cross, if I will go all the way, 
If I'll finish this race, if I'll finish what the Father is asking me, these greater works will be possible, and I will no longer be limited by this human body. And that's the big one. I'm going to make greater works possible. And let me tell you how. He says, as we finish up, verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, everybody say, in my name, that I will do. Are you getting it? That's what I'm going to do it. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything, everybody say anything. In my name, everybody say in my name. I will do it. Everybody say perfect. I need a Hummer. I'm going to need a Hummer. I'm going to need a new Tesla. Why is that obviously not what Jesus means? He just, he just, we know there must be some type of boundaries around this. We know there must be. Say, so, well, in order, Jesus, for me to do your work, I need you to kill so-and-so, or at least put him in the hospital. How do we know that's not what anything means, everybody? Because he said, in his name. So we need to speak, stop for just a second and put some controls on this, because the apostles would have heard it, and we need to hear it. American Christianity says that Christianity, you know, it's, it's the... It's the magic eight ball, God just gives you what you want kind of a thing, right? And they quote verses like this. So let's stop for a second, because many of you have prayed for things and you did not receive them. So let's stop for a second and recognize what it is Jesus is saying. He is saying, when you pray for them in my name, and we think what that means is, by throwing Jesus' name at the end of a prayer as if it's a magical incantation. Well, if I just throw the name of Jesus out, then I'll get this thing. How many of you think that's what he's talking about? Is in his name ever meant something like that? In the Old Testament or the New Testament? No, not at all. What does he mean? Let me, you could say it in different ways. I'm just going to say it in these two ways for those of you who are taking notes. Ready? I'm going to say it these two ways. And this is going to help some people from getting their hearts broken. Because we think God's going to give us everything we ask for, and we, we think he's promised that, and then when he doesn't, we think, oh, he's betrayed us, he doesn't exist. But let's, let's make sure we understand what in his name means. Two things. To pray for something in his name means to, and notice what he just said, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Because when you pray for things in the name of Trey, and they don't happen, right, surprise, when you pray for things in the name of Muhammad and it doesn't happen, you pray for things in the name of all of that is good and it doesn't happen. When you pray in the name of Confucius and it doesn't happen, that means nothing. But when you pray for something in the name of Jesus and he does it, that means that what Jesus is saying is true. That's, that's the end component of his argument. When you watch these greater works happening, all bathed in prayers in my name, then you're going to see for yourself that I am in the Father and the Father is in me and that's why I am the way to the Father. See how this is a lot? This is a lot, but it all goes together so we fin let's finish this up. In my name means at least these two things. Number one, to pray for something on the basis of Christ's saving mission and glory. I am praying for this thing on the basis of Christ's saving mission and glory. I'll give you a second. I'm praying this thing on the basis of Christ's saving mission and glory. You cannot separate Christ from his saving mission, but here's, here's what I mean by that. When you pray, the only reason you are able to pray is because Christ finished his mission. So to pray in his name is to recognize that. I acknowledge that the only reason I can ask God for anything is because of Christ's saving mission and his glory. That's the first thing. So on the basis of, so what is in his name means on the basis of his saving mission and glory. And then here's the second one. For the sake of his save, continuing saving mission and glory. When I pray in his name, I'm praying for the sake of Christ's continuing, saving mission and glory. It's not, um, this is my personal prayer, and if I'm just praying to make the football team. That would have been completely 
mind-boggling to the apostles. But it's the kind of thick-headed stuff we do. What Jesus is saying is, when you pray and you need something for the greater works, you pray for it on the basis of me completing my mission and for the sake of the continuing mission, and I'll make sure you get what you need. You have no one else in heaven that can do that. No one else in heaven is standing by, no longer constrained to a human body, able to give you the things you need that will glorify the Father, and you'll pray it in Jesus' name, which means that vindicates everything Jesus has just said about him being the Father and the Father being him. Okay? So I want to back up a second, and let's summarize the last part this way. Believing in Jesus is the way to the Father because the Father and the Son are one and the greater works prove it. The greater works of the church, not of one church, but the greater works of the churches all over the world and the gospel mission, the greater works that include miracles, yes, but include so many varieties of so many things that are happening all over the world and have been happening for 2,000 years get in the middle of the greater works, every single one of them happening because they're being bathed in prayer. When you see that happening, you know I am distributing what my believers need, and now the works have gone global, they've gone viral, so to speak, and that's why they're greater works. More than just one person in three years of their life could ever do. And when you see that happening, then you know that everything I've just told you is true. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and in knowing me is to know the Father. So one last time, would you guys just read this whole thing with me? Believing in Jesus is the way to the Father, because the Father and the Son are one, and the greater works prove it. Thank you for hanging on through that. As you close up shop there, If you're left with more questions than answers, uh, there are more answers, but you're not alone. And I want to talk with you some more. I love to talk about these kinds of things, and sometimes just to hear the kinds of things that you'll say. But I want to finish up with my departure journal again, because to me, this is the most, this is the most important part, really. In my departure journal, I'm, I'm taking a look at the greater works and I write this to my loved ones. I'm leaving, but I want you to know your belief in Christ is the most important thing you have, so hold on to it. But there will be storms. There will be dark, dark days. There will be lies on top of lies but hold on to your belief in Christ. Write it in there. You must hold on to your belief in Christ. But how are you going to do that? By keeping yourself right in the middle of the greater works. When you're in the church, greater works are happening all around you and more and more, stay in that. Because that is regular evidence for Christ. And you're going to need it more than you know. However you decide to write that down. Let's take just a moment, some quiet. Jerry's going to lower the lights, and let's process for a few minutes. I'm going to step out of the way and let you do some thinking and praying however you decide to write that.